In some ways, it feels like we're all in a hot air balloon and we're drifting further and further away from the Earth, losing connection. We may have a better view of the planet than we've ever had before in human history, but we've lost touch with locality, with the wildlife that lives around us, and what that wildlife is telling us about the wider world. Survey after survey has shown that children can't even name the most common trees and birds and wildflowers that live alongside them. They have no relationship with the natural world. That's not only bad for their own mental health and well-being, it doesn't bode well for the future. Because what this pandemic has shown us is how much we need nature and depend on it but also what happens when we disrespect it. Already the Earth has lost 50% of the mass of wildlife on Earth. Half as many birds fly and sing, half as many bees buzz, half as many wildflowers bloom as 50 years ago. So we need naturalists for the future, people who understand the workings of the world, we need young people to be able to name, observe and record the world around them. To be able to collect data and know how to use that data. And understand how British natural history connects us to the rest of the world. But this GCSE will do far more than that. It will explain how nature has inspired so much of our art, music and literature through time. And you don't have to live in the countryside to do it. There's so much in the city as well. The good young naturalists of today have become fascinated by the natural world because someone has inspired them and taught them. This GCSE will give young people a bedrock of awe and wonder which will see them through the whole of their lives. Britain has a long history of studying natural history. We are a nation that loves the natural world and yet that history that heritage we're in danger of losing on our watch. If we don't have a thriving natural world, we can't thrive ourselves. We also lose an incredible source of inspiration and joy. That's why I'm passionate about this GCSE in natural history. I know it isn't a silver bullet, but it is a step in the right direction to connecting young people back to the earth, engendering a sense of awe and wonder and love being able to study it scientifically, but also having an emotional connection. Britain is a nation of nature lovers, yet according to the State of Nature report, we're also ranked as one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. The shocking fact is that within my lifetime alone, almost half of our wildlife has been wiped out. Now, while I was puzzling over this paradox, I came across the powerful words of the US writer, Richard Louvre, in his wonderful book, Last Child in the Woods where he points out that we cannot protect something we don't love, we can't love what we don't know, and we can't know what we don't see or hear or sense. And that got me thinking that maybe one of the reasons that we've allowed such widespread destruction of nature and wildlife is because people simply don't know what we're losing until it's too late, and they never learn to love it. Now, children in particular are more removed from nature than ever before. Many of them are growing up indoors, it's been found that prisoners spend more time in the open air than most of our children do. So when, a few years ago, I found out about Mary Colwell's brilliant initiative for a natural history GCSE, I felt so inspired. And it's been a joy working with her and others to promote this idea inside Parliament and out to help bring it to fruition. A GCSE in natural history will provide rigorous and structured field skills, immerse young people in the awe and wonder of the natural world, and teach the interconnectedness of nature to other aspects of life. It'll make links between nature and culture, exploring how nature is inspired, art and music, literature and poetry, film and radio, as well as the digital space. There has never been a more important moment to reconnect young people to the natural world. Our future, quite literally, depends on it. Hello, my name's Tim Smith. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Eden Project and its co-founder. Unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, I'm in my very small Eden Project here in Cornwall. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about 
the Natural History GCSE. I make no bones about it that while geography and biology and the rest of the sciences are important, we're living in a period where we need to be seeing holism, completeness, if you like, the return to a form of natural philosopher where we saw the, the whole picture uh, of the world uh, and its interconnections. For me, if you were to ask me really honestly, if there was one thing I could do in my life, let alone within the educational framework, it would be that all people were learning natural history. It is the fabric of life. It is the ecology that makes everything work. It is the cultural glue which links all other studies together and makes coherent sense of us being earthlings uh, and having a relationship to everything else that is living on this small planet we share with all other things. We're gonna be looking at what young people should be learning or could be learning to meet the future. It's gonna be really exciting projects about new food systems, new connections, biological neural networks which actually reflect the way we work. The COVID has shown us that actually it is through connection and local interconnection that we become resilient. Resilience and neural networks are going to be the buzzwords of the next 10 years and I want our young people to lead the world in understanding that these new careers are still there to be made and that the future still remains for us to make. It's not too late but we've got to dare to throw away the old ways and embrace the new with a completely new way of looking at putting the world into common sense for us all to understand. I'm Kabir Kaul. I'm a young conservationist and wildlife writer. Firstly, I think a natural history GCSE is a fantastic idea. Over the coming decades, more and more of us will be living in towns and cities and children are already spending the least time outside in human history. A natural history GCSE, however, can turn that around swiftly by offering students the opportunity to learn about, appreciate and protect the biodiversity on their very doorstep. My generation and those to come can regain that special connection we once had with the natural world, leading many more of us to help preserve the ecological wonders of our country for generations to come. Hello, I'm Jill Duffy, Chief Executive for the UK Exam Board OCR, which is part of Cambridge Assessment, a non-teaching department of the University of Cambridge. When the naturalist and writer Mary Colwell approached my colleague Tim Oates and myself with her proposal to develop a GCSE in natural history, we didn't hesitate we immediately saw that such a GCSE would bring new and inciting things to study and encourage young people to engage with the natural world around them. Introducing a new GCSE to an already crowded curriculum is not straightforward and comes with a great deal of responsibility because of the potential impact it can have on the study choices and experiences of young people. It also needs the support of government and the qualifications regulator so we have to demonstrate that the subject is coherent, worthwhile, and that any GCSE is as rigorous and demanding as other subjects. That's why OCR has already conducted a large nationwide consult consultation on our proposals for this new GCSE. This consultation drew over 2,000 responses, many from young people. Nearly all of the responses were positive, with over 90% of respondents supporting core proposals. Here's a brief overview of the findings. 90% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed with our def definition of natural history. 96% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed outdoor study should be an important part of a GCSE in natural history. 93% of young people expected some time studying outdoors. 91% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed with the proposed purpose of a GCSE in natural history. And 94% of young people would have liked or would like the option to study such a qualification. During our consultation, we've been in touch with many stakeholders and continue to be impressed by the expertise and passion shown by so many individuals and the organisations they represent. 
This slide shows just a few of the many organisations that have supported our proposals. And you'll see that the Eastbourne Schools Partnership is amongst that forest of logos there. We have also created a strategic advisory board made up of representatives from a wide range of interested organisations, including the NAE, leading experts in the field, practitioners, and some incredibly insightful and impressive young people. Board members are never afraid to challenge us or each other, and I see no signs of us becoming complacent. We also have a forum especially for consulting with teachers, which certainly keeps us grounded in the realities of what is possible in schools. We have now filed a report based on the findings of our consultation with the Department for Education and we're eagerly awaiting their response. Obviously, these are busy and uncertain times and we expect that the government will want to conduct its own consultation, which will take time. However, we are hoping that we will have developed a GCSE to be available in schools at the earliest in September 2023 with first assessments in June 2025. And on that timeline, materials would need to be available for centres by September 2022 at the latest. So why is a natural history GCSE important? We feel that fostering an engagement with and an understanding of the natural world is hugely important for all sorts of reasons, starting with the demands of young people themselves. Recent research carried out by Off Oxfam shows how young people want to learn more about the world around them. The figures show that only 4% of students feel that they know a lot about climate change and that 70% want to learn about the environment. For whatever reasons, the, there is compelling evidence that children are losing contact with the natural world. For example, a recent survey told us that 83% of children aged between 5 and 16 could not identify a bumblebee, 97% could not identify a beech leaf, and 96% could not identify a cabbage white butterfly. And one in five children living in England's most deprived areas spend no time in the natural environment. Many of those supporting demands for GCSE see it as part of a need to change what is taught in schools to reflect the very real climate urgency we're facing. We're delighted to have amongst the stakeholders contributing to our development an organisation called Teach the Future. Teach the Future is an organisation run by young people that campaigns for a new curriculum designed to help people understand and respond to the climate crisis. And examples of the impact of the crisis can be seen on our very doorstep. Hedgehog numbers have declined by 95% since the 1950s. 41% of UK species have declined since the 1970s. And 97% of UK wildflower meadows have been lost in the last century. And here are just a couple of comments from responses to our own consultation on a natural history GCSE. I think it's really important to learn about our environment and how we got here and the world around us. It's even more important to be educating people on the effect of human life on the planet. Too many people take nature for granted, so having this subject may change people's perspectives and that's what we need to do. The global pandemic that we're experiencing and the impact of climate change we are witnessing firsthand underline our need as humans to understand the value of and our relationship with the environment in our towns and cities, the wider countryside and across the globe. And a good place to start will be the study of natural history. So what have we proposed should be in a natural history GCSE? To fully appreciate the complexity, diversity and interconnectedness of the natural world, it's important to study it closely and interact with it through field research and measurement. Natural history provides opportunities to develop these skills out in the field as well as in a classroom or in a laboratory. 
essential part of the study of natural history has to be getting out there and investigating the natural world. This could involve a clifftop walk near Eastbourne, but it will be just as valid to be visiting a small park in an inner city or an old cemetery. There are some big themes as well, such as studying how a landscape has evolved, looking at evidence of earlier life forms, classifying and understanding different types of flora and fauna, observing interrelationships and biodiversity. And no study of natural history will be complete without the study of how humans have responded to nature in art and culture, and of course, how humans have impacted on the environment. In this way, studying natural history can make an important contribution to understanding the relationship between the natural world and culture, policy decisions, scientific research and technology. Of course, natural history isn't a subject that stands apart from the rest of the curriculum. There must be elements of the whole curriculum from early years through to Key Stage 5 and beyond that build and develop young people's interest in and understanding of the natural world. On its own, the subject can't equip young people with all the skills, knowledge and attitudes they will need to support them through a very uncertain future. Learners need a broad and balanced curriculum that delivers all the sciences, the arts, global perspectives and understanding of politics, the importance of responsible citizenship, critical thinking. I could go on and on. Natural history has sufficient distinct context to make it a subject in its own right but it also has all the ingredients that can pull together key strands from across the curriculum in a positive and integrated way. But as important as these issues are, the most important thing is that we do all that is possible to make natural history accessible and relevant to all. This means, as an absolute starting point, that schools must be able to deliver all aspects, including fieldwork, wherever they are and however limited their resources are. As part of our consultation, we sought to understand who would teach the proposed specification and what support they would need when preparing for and delivering the qualification. The responses are clear. Not only do we have the commitment of teachers to the proposed qualification, we also have key organisations such as the Natural History Museum with its impressive educational services and local school support network prepared to step forward with support to schools in developing their provision, delivery of the learning and in sharing of good practice. As I suggested earlier, we must ensure that pupils in urban settings can achieve the qualification by engaging with nature they can in their immediate locality. For example, by identifying flowers you might call them weeds in urban settings and tracing them back to their origins, analysing why they were there, how they got there and investigating the community of organisms they support. We need to demonstrate that natural history is for everyone. That means celebrating a diverse range of naturalists from around the world, from different cultures and periods of history. It means ensuring a diverse input to develop and promote the qualifications and it means supporting a global perspective alongside a local one. In other words, we must have a qualification that everyone recognises as being relevant to them and does not get labelled as something for other people who are not like us. So, in conclusion, there is a long way to go yet and there will be many challenges along the way. However, with the input and ongoing support of so many people, we think we can achieve something special. If a GCSE in natural history can play a part in inspiring young people, wherever they live and whatever their background, to develop a passion for nature, then it will all have been worthwhile. Thank you. Jill's already outlined the really key statistics associated with the consultation. The, the high number of respondents, over 2,500, and the well over 90% support for the key aspects of the proposed qualification. She also outlined statistics associated with young people's engagement with nature and the way in which that has decayed over previous decades to the point where we are now. 
we think there's a really, really critical need for the, the GCSE in natural history. It addresses so many concerns associated with young people's engagement with the natural world. So the consultation confirms that the content is well defined and it, it confirms it will make a unique contribution to education. It's welcomed by young people and its design and delivery is well supported. All of those things are vital. And it's understandable that the, the DfE has placed a moratorium on new subjects. Any addition needs a strong and coherent rationale and must make a distinctive contribution to the depth and breadth of the curriculum. And I think the consultation shows that this one does. It is needed. Um, environmental issues and concerns, of course, arise in other GCSEs, but the rich knowledge content and the practical field study element of the proposed GCSE provides focused, deep study of the natural world. And the study of whole organisms in context is vital and is distinctive. It not only engages young people, but reinstates something which has been lost from the natural sciences. And higher education would like to see it reinstated into the school curriculum. Uh, and that is you know, engagement with whole organisms in context. Observation of the natural world was highlighted and emphasised in primary education in the revised national curriculum in 2014. Uh, and the provision of the GCSE strengthens and reinforces this through provision of formal recognition at the age of 16. And our understanding of the natural world was progressed hugely through the amateur tradition of amateur scientists of the 19th and early 20th century. Not amateur in what they did, or the standards they did it to, but amateur in the way in which ordinary people were engaged in in-depth study of nature. Not something done remotely by distant specialists, but accessible to all. And as Jill says, just as young people are growing more distance from animals and plants, they're expressing a need to reconnect with nature. We believe that GCSE is fundamental to that re-engagement. The overwhelmingly positive response to the consultation suggests that educationalist parents and young people think so too. Now there have been questions about, is this a rural qualification? Is this something that only can be done in the green and pleasant land of England? I don't think so at all. It's kind of the wrong way to think. Um, and maybe thinking at a different scale helps. I mean, you mustn't forget that Darwin was particularly engaged with barnacles, and they're not known for being furry or big. Um, that's really important. So let's think about this. Of course, the rural environment offers loads of opportunities for studying red kite or roe deer, uh, oaks to otters. But, but those organisms, whilst fascinating and, and amazing in their own right, it causes us to stop and think, what about fungi, or insects, or arachnids, or bacteria, or viruses, or mosses, or lichens? No, we're now thinking on a different scale. It's a bit like Darwin's barnacles. Um, it helps us think about what can be done in the urban environment. In walk, walking along, in the urban environment, we can, we can see um, the overgrown corner of a local park. We, we can see the weeds that begin to take over a pavement, or, or the insects inhabiting a window box. We can see the lichen on a garden wall. These are all things which are the very stuff of natural history. Actually understanding what these organisms do, what they are doing, how they contribute, how they're threatened by change, how they respond to change and exploit change in the natural environment. So, yeah, of course the big organisms are important, and they occur in the urban environment too. And I, the kestrel that I saw on a school, uh, a school roof in North London, eyeing up the small birds in the adjacent gardens, yeah, yeah they're there too, but let, let's make no mistake about it, the rich knowledge and understanding and the practical activity which is at the heart of the GCSE can be applied in the urban environment easily and readily and open the eyes of young people 
to what's going on around them. Myriad organisms engaged in productive activity in the urban environment. I suppose the final thing I want to emphasise is, is, is what young people and teachers and, and people who I've, I've discussed this with, ex-teachers, um, parents of, of friends of mine, and people in org organisations that we've consulted. And I've listed all those different people because they all tend to say the same thing when they know that we're developing a proposed GCSE in natural history. They ask about the content and once we've discussed it in detail, what they say is almost universally the same thing. What they say is, um, if it had been available in school when I was there, I would have done it. And I think that's really compelling. Well, well on the basis of that, on, on the basis of the work that we've done on the aims, the content, and the assessment model, and the extent to which that has been really welcomed in the consultation, let's actually make it available to a new generation of young people. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Tim Oates, and um, I welcome the opportunity to talk today about um, the proposed GCSE in, in natural history. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say a, a few words about myself. Um, so, as I say, I'm Tim Oates. I'm Director of Research at Cambridge Assessment and work alongside Jill Duffy. Um, but I worked with Mary Colwell when she first approached us with an idea for a GCSE. Um, I met with Caroline and Lucas and with uh, Mary in, um, in London and, and we, we mapped out three years ago um, what the pathway uh, from Mary's idea about a GCSE to actually getting it on the stocks and getting it into the offices of the department for consideration as being a live GCSE. So um, we, we've, we've done a great deal of work on specifying the content. We've done a great deal of work on the assessment model and, and we've tried to fit it within the, the framework of policy that exists in this country. And the, the government is quite, quite justifiably nervous about new GCSEs. They don't want to clutter up the catalogue. They don't want to threaten the, the rightful focus on uh, a, a limited catalogue of GCSEs to enable everybody to access a common core. But we do think this is a time for, for an addition because of all, all the unique, unique things that it offers. Okay, a few questions coming in. Um, is it available to all ages? Well, well it's a GCSE. Um, and, and I mentioned in, in my um, presentation as part of the film that the national curriculum in primary now includes a, a focus on observing uh, and engaging with nature, classifying leaves, uh, identifying species and so on. Um, so there's this continued continuum of learning um, but, but we know that Key Stage 4 is dominated by GCSEs. So, so it is valuable to have something which is formal and certificated. It, it's therefore principally a qualification for the 13 to 16 segment of education. The GCSEs are not age limited and there's no, no kind of formal legal requirement. They can only be taken by 16 year olds. They can be available in FE for adult learners uh, and they can be taken by children of any age. Um, but I mean, the, the, the framework and the content is particularly focused for 16 year olds. And we'll build support in terms of teachers, uh, in terms of learners, learning materials and so on. We're working with the Natural History Museum, making sure that there are local um, centers of excellence right the way across England um, with curriculum materials, resources um, available for supporting the delivery of the, of the GCSE. Um, other, other questions, um, urban, rural, I think we've dealt with, with that issue that um, we, we think there, there are many opportunities in an urban environment for studying organisms and, and whole organisms in context and, and changes in, in the natural world. 
in the urban environment. The, the specification also includes a way in which um, we regulate and engage with the natural world, um, legislation around protection and so on. It, um, it, it can include work on national park network um, and particularly it includes uh, a strong theme theme on the way in which um, the way in which um, the natural world has been re represented in art and literature. So, so I, th I think you know the rural and urban stuff is is very well dealt with. Um, okay, let me have a look at a few more things. Um, how we will create? How will we create a cadre of teachers who are confident of teaching such a new GCSE? That that was something which officials have already challenged us with. How how, how will we um, create this cadre? How, what kind of CPD? continuing professional development will be on offer. That's where we work with, with other organisations. And Jill emphasised the, the rich range of organisations which have stepped forward to say, yeah, we really want to support this GCSE. Quite a lot of those, the Field Studies Council, the Natural History Museum, local museums network, all are saying, well, we, we, we support teachers with a, with a lot, and have been supporting them over the last few decades with a rich body of resources and, uh, and, and professional development activities. And we really want to make sure that we can select from all, all of this things that are specifically supportive of the GCSE. Um, we also know the timing of its introduction needs to allow adequate preparation in schools. Uh, and so first teaching in 2023, first exams 2025, that allows a, a, a really good run at curriculum development in schools and teachers accessing CPD. Which teachers? Well, obviously, you know, biologists and geographers have stepped forward, but, but we've had lots of English teachers and, and teachers in art, uh, and art and design coming forward saying, I'm very committed to this GCSE and, and I'd like to learn how to become someone who can develop the provision with other specialists in my school, which is great. So, so we're, see, we're seeing that as, as, a, as a good base for its provision across a wide range of schools uh, in England. Um, will we be able to, another question, will we be able to support the lack of experienced teachers using online teaching? Well, I think that's changing rapidly. Um, we, we've seen a you know, dramatic increase of the use of online learning um, as a result of, of response to pandemic. Um, at, at, at Cambridge, we say, you know, goodness me, teachers, schooling, still very, very necessary. So don't, don't let's just overemphasize the extent to which online learning can substitute for the experience which is provided in schooling. But yeah, I think I think online learning will play a role in this. I mean, I like the idea of, of students, for example, exchanging experiences of the specific focus that they might adopt in a, in a, in a GCSE in natural history. The intent where, where they do the intensive field work on specific organisms and, get, and really dig into their interests, it would be great if they were to share the unfolding work that they're doing with other kids as they're doing it. How can we provide third? third how can we provide for field studies in the middle of timetabling for other GC? I agree that's challenging. Um, it's quite a time commitment. We know that that field and safe field study, very important. But, but mo most of the people have looked at it, at geography teachers who are very experienced in the provision of field work, um, biology teachers who, who are used to the older qualifications that used to be there in CSE and O-level, um, which required field work. They've been quite reassuring about this, that it can be built in, that it's very engaging for young people, and it, and it pulls them back into productive activity in the school. Um, might this link with Julian Glover's report on national landscapes? For sure. And uh, Robert McFarlane's work on, on lost, lost uh, terminology, lost vocabulary. Um, his work on, on the, the landscapes of Great Britain. I mean, one of the beach stands, which he describes in, in one of his 
one of his brilliant books, is just down the road from me. And, and I know that his book actually pulled more and more people in, into that beach stand to experience its wonder. Right, interesting. Would you look at calling it something like GCSE Nature to attract more people? Uh, that's a good one, because we had almost everyone that I've spoken to over the last two years says, oh, natural history, that's a bit old fashioned. Uh, what's, it, what's it gonna include? Uh, should call it something else. Then we talk about what it does include, um, the history of engagement with the natural world, the representation of the natural world in art and literature, um, and the extent to which organizations like the Natural History Museum will support it. And they suddenly say, hmm, actually, natural history is the best thing for it, isn't it? So, so we have explored different titles. Um, and when, when and, and if Ofqual decide to consult on it and the DFE consult on it, for sure, the title will be up for grabs. Um, but it's interesting that we just come back to GCSE Natural History time after time after time, because actually that's quite a sensitive and effective description of what it contains. Um, how do you think this new GCSE will fit into a packed curriculum? Well, typically, I mean, we know the numbers at Cambridge because we run a lot of GCSEs uh, and IGCSEs around the world. Uh, and typically kids take about nine GCSEs. Um, we, we, we know how it fits into accountability arrangements. Um, obviously children are required to do English, maths, uh, two, two sciences and so on within those accountability arrangements. We, we don't want it to, to displace the main sciences. So we think GCSE Natural History would sit outside the EBAC as one of the two to three uh, GCSEs which children choose from a broad range of options. We think that's the right position. It, it, it's one more thing um, from which to choose. And what we know is that if children can choose and make a choice around a subject that they love and enjoy, then that integrates them better into schooling. So, so I think we're okay with that. Um, the, the detail of our submission to the department makes it clear as to where we're, where we're fitting it within the current constellation of GCSEs. Um, this is great, I'm really supportive, just wondering what happens post GCSE and therefore going on to a degree, will there be an A-level? Good question. At the current time, no. Um, we think that the natural history GCSE does reinstate something into the study uh, of the natural world, which is not there currently in biology or geography. It is a genuinely unique contribution. There may be a time when we feel that there might be an A-level in it, um, but what people from higher education are saying is, well, goodness me, we've lost that in biology. Um, we've even lost it in natural sciences in Cambridge. Um, we'd like this, this, this expertise in field study, understanding of the way in which nature has been represented. It'll be, it's a very good thing. Um, and we have lost it from the more abstract um, uh, uh, redefinition of biology and geography, which has been going on over the last three or four decades. Um, and, and kids who've done GCSE will have that good grounding when they go through A level and then into higher education. But it, it could lead to upward pressure in, uh, in relationship to what is there by way of choice in A level uh, and will certainly enrich um, uh, higher education. Um, legislation is constantly changing. Will the GCSE be updated annually, regularly to reflect this? And will there be teacher training events and OCR updates? A absolutely on those latter. And I've already dealt with the issue of teacher training events, continuous and, and well distributed around the country. And so, so, so don't worry, we, we, we don't think a new GCSE should exist without having that underpinning foundation of professional support. Uh, yep, legislation is constantly changing. Will the GCSE be updated annually, regularly? Well, for sure, regularly. Um, by and large, um, qualifications have been changed a bit too frequently in England, um, which, which leads to, to really good notes and activities being, being discarded. Um, but we, it will be up, updated regularly enough to reflect the, 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 the constant change in, in legislation and so on. 
Okay, those are the questions so far. Um, any more coming in? Let's have a look. Um, no, that's about it. How, how are we on time? 20 minutes to go until, uh, and, until six o'clock. Rob, in the chat, can you, five minutes to go, Rob has just said. Um, so let's see if any more questions come in. If not, I will filibuster for five minutes and just talk about some of the things um, that are associated with the, uh, with the qualification. No more questions? Okay, so um, no more questions, end whenever you like. Okay, so, so what, what we've got in terms of, I'll just run through, through the key ideas for a few minutes. Uh, the importance of observing and understanding whole organisms and the systems in which they sit, including systematic methods for collecting and using data. We think it'll be knowledge rich and it will involve lots of techniques for observing and for recording, which are not present in other GCSEs. Uh, the dynamic nature of organisms and environments, change and challenges which occur in the natural world, including the impact of human behavior. Complex interdependencies and relationships which enable the well-being and continued health of organisms and the ecosystems in which they depend. Description, classification and interpretation of the natural world in human culture, and the way in which this has changed over time. And, and this thing about scale that I mentioned in my contribution, micro, meso and macro, ways of seeing organisms from the tiny to the large and from the local to the national and international. We, we've constructed those key ideas very carefully and, and, and they kind of survived consultation. People really supported them. They added, added a few tweaks here and there, but, but those are the things which have gone forward to the department. How will GCSE tackle the topic of climate change? Now you heard in what um, Mary and uh, uh, Caroline and Jill and Tim Smith said in, in, the, in the somewhat jerky film, sorry about the jerky delivery, but absolutely will tackle the issue of dynamic change in environments and the response that flora and fauna are giving to those changes. It will acknowledge climate change and it will enable people to examine the impact of change, not only climate change, on environments around them. The, the change in water levels in water courses, um, the way in which changing rainfall patterns have led to change in the species and uh, uh, the flora and fauna, the species which are colonizing uh, local areas. So yeah, absolutely it will tackle the, the topic of climate change and it'll deal with the science of climate change and the way in which whole organisms and their context are responding to that change. Um, okay, I think we're round about there any more any more questions coming in no okay i mean i really like to say you know please support this um please tell us what we need to make it live in an appropriate way within schools um most of the most of the negative responses and and the detail which we had um by way of what we should change in the specification through the consultation, we need, we've been able to accommodate. You know, there haven't been absolute showstoppers. Uh, and we've had 90% support um, for what it is that we've done, the overall idea, the specific content. Um, and, and, and I'll end on, on the thing which is just coming up time and time again, which is people saying, gosh, if it were made available, either I would have done it or I would have liked to have done it. And I think that really says that we need to press, it, press ahead strongly with this being part of the national